Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining um, Mount Am Astronomy program this evening. Um, I'm Nidhi Son, uh, the webmaster of Mount Am. I'm honored to represent Tinka Ross, the illustrious founder of the Mount Am Astronomy program. Um, she couldn't be with, her, with us here tonight, um, but she's made all of these events possible, so thanks to her. Uh, before we start, um, I request everyone to hold the questions till the end of the presentation. Um, you can unmute yourselves and, uh, or you could pay, post uh, the question on the chat window and uh, I can read it out for you, uh, whatever works for you. Um, all right, um, our speaker this evening is Carolyn Perko. Carolyn is an award-winning planetary scientist and explorer and a popular public spokesperson on science, planetary exploration, and the future of humanity. She was the leader of the Imaging Science team on the Cassini mission to Saturn from 1990 to 2017, and an Imaging Scientist on the celebrated Voyager mission to the outer solar system in the 1980s. Asteroid Perko 7231 is named in her honor. She has co-authored over 130 scientific papers in planetary science, and her popular science writings and op-eds have been published in such distinguished publications as the London Sunday Times, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Houston Chronicle, Guardian, New Statesman, and more. Over the years, she's earned the titles of 15 people the next president of the United States should listen to, 50 people who matter today, and 25 most influential people in space. She was the character consultant on Carl Sagan's 1997 film, Contact, and the science consultant on the 2009 film, Star Trek. She was awarded the 2010 Carl Sagan Med Medal by the American Astronomical Society and the 2011 Distinguished Alumni Award from Caltech. She's currently a visiting scholar at UC Berkeley and a fellow of the California Academy of Sciences. In tonight's presentation, Carolyn Perko will give us her take on the recent developments in space exploration and what it means for all of humanity now and into the future. Please welcome the eminent personality, Carolyn Perko. Okay, thank you very much, Nidhi. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. It's just, you know, nice and intimate and we're gonna just have a good time. So exactly. let me begin. Uh, and uh, can everybody see the screen? Yes, we can see. Okay, good. So one of those items that's on my list of things I'm most grateful for in life is that I came of age at a time when humanity was taking its first steps off the planet. And that era, the 1960s, was famously tumultuous and upsetting. But for those of us paying attention to the preparations that we were making to travel into space and the effect those initial steps were having on our culture, it was a thrilling time to be alive. Despite all the chaos around us, we and my generation were excited about the future. And the optimism of that era was probably best captured in the 1968 film that no one who saw back then ever forgets. And of course, I'm talking about 2001, A Space Odyssey. Uh, it's hard to describe what it was like to see this movie for the first time, especially when you were 15 years old. There had never been anything like it before, and it left a strong and very vivid impression of what the future was going to look like, like video conferencing from space and uh, being tended to by waitresses in style, stylish uniforms and shuttling across the moon and taking a spaceship all the way to Jupiter and beyond. And of course, only a year later, Apollo 11 landed on the moon, which was ample demonstration to my teenage self that we were surely on our way. It was all very, very seductive. And many of us went following careers that was soon available to us in the scientific exploration of the solar system. But, in the intervening 50 plus years, I have come to realize that the vision of the future created by 2001 was an illusion. And from a long distance now, I recognize that underlying the mesmerizing imagery of technology far superior to what we had on the eve of Apollo 11 
And part of the seduction was my tacit assumption that if we had our act together so well that we could live in space and undertake interplanetary travel, then life on Earth would be near perfect. And of course, it turned out not exactly to be the case. Yes, life on Earth did vastly improve for our, our species. People, and many more of them than ever before, are living longer and healthier lives. We now get on airplanes the way people 50 years ago would get in a car and go across town. And we eat grapes that come all the way from Chile in the middle of the winter. But that progress has come at a tremendous cost to our underlying natural support systems. And as you undoubtedly know, our biosphere and our surface environment on which we critically depend are steadily and rapidly being eroded. How did we get to this point? Well, by many intersecting roads, and I'm just gonna mention two. First, in adopting new technologies, we never pause to evaluate all the long-term consequences. We rush into development without doing what is called systems engineering. And that is a comprehensive end-to-end -end design and analysis of a very complex system with many interacting components over its entire life cycle. We do systems engineering in the space program all the time, but it's never done when considering how new technologies will affect our planet, our civic life, our physical and psychological health, and so on. And second, our economic model doesn't even allow for that kind of evaluation. Instead, our economic model relies on endless growth and turns a blind eye towards exploitation of resources and the inevitable creation of waste. Yes, it was a model that enabled great advances when resources were unlimited, but these limits have now been reached. And we are facing today what was called back in 1968, the same year that 2001 was released, the tragedy of the commons. All over the planet, our common resources are being polluted, overused, and destroyed. Our oceans, our fresh water, our forests, the air we breathe, our soils, arable lands, wildlife, and so on. Despite all this, we're being told that there's cause for optimism. We're being reminded that there is another dimension that we haven't yet exploited. It's the third dimension. It's called space. And we are in fact now in the era of new space when commercial interests long chomping at the bit for access to space and the profits that await there have been given the green light and they are finally making headway. Now, for many years, I have been an enthusiastic promoter of human exploration of the solar system as opposed to robotic. I wanted robotic, of course, that's how I made my career but I was also an enthusiastic supporter of humans going into space. And I naively perhaps imagined that the most ambitious projects would be undertaken by a consortium of nations as we did with the Cassini mission to Saturn. But I am dismayed to witness the exhilaration that many of us felt at extending our reach across the solar system now being hijacked by profiteers. And I see in this, the very same forces that have been so ruinous to our planet down here are being enacted all over again above our heads. Now, to be fair, we're seeing some amazing thing these days from new space. Like not one, but two rocket boosters returning to earth backwards. Uh, but there have also been some ridiculous excesses. Who can forget? Starman and, and his red Tesla convertible with Earth in the background. This is no longer we came in peace for all mankind. This is now the era of, I'm going to launch my red convertible into space, bro, and if you don't like it, that's your problem. We're also hearing some absurd marketing, like mining asteroids will save the Earth. And Elon Musk wants to terraform Mars. He wants to turn the surface environment of Mars habitable 
so that we could move there permanently and avoid disaster down here on Earth. And Jeff Bezos wants to build space colonies in orbit around the Earth because he says we're going to run out of energy and there's going to be too many of us to occupy the Earth, and so we have to get off the planet. And even the late Stephen Hawking famously said that we need to get in a spaceship and find another habitable planet around another star, or else we humans will face extinction due to things like asteroid strikes and epidemics and overpopulation. The message from these guys is clear. We can only save ourselves if we leave the Earth. And I say, not so fast. Let's take these claims one by one. What about terraforming Mars? <clears throat> Recent results from Mars orbiting spacecraft have shown an inventory of CO2 on Mars that is inadequate to warm and pressurize the atmosphere and make the planet habitable. That is, even if we could afford the colossal planet-wide engineering task of mobilizing all that CO2, getting it out of the ground, getting it out of the ice and injecting it into the atmosphere. And even then, if we could do all that, there still would be no oxygen to breathe. So that would have to be manufactured on Mars as well. And there is exceedingly fine dust on Mars everywhere. As some of you might remember, the Apollo astronauts all complained about the dust on the moon getting into the crevices of their spacesuits, making it hard to move, getting into the lunar module where they breathed it. Well, on Mars, that dust happens to be toxic. Astronauts with black lung disease, does that sound like a good outcome? I don't think so. Oh, and by the way, the surface gravity on Mars is only 38% that of the Earth. Which brings me to reality. Real life space travel is not Star Trek. We have come to learn that the human body does not like reduced gravity for long periods of time for a whole host of medical reasons, nor does it like being irradiated by cosmic radiation. And that's not even to mention the psychological ill effects of being in confined spaces for exceedingly long periods of time. Staying mentally and physically healthy under those circumstances would be an enormous obstacle to human colonists trying to live their lives and giving birth to successive generations on Mars. We were simply not evolved to live in such conditions. It may be sad, but it is highly likely there will never be a family lineage with a permanent Martian address. Now, maybe someday we will have a human presence on the moon and Mars in the same way that we have a presence at the South Pole of the Earth today, a research station continuously inhabited, but not by the same people. These would be small scientific outposts, not cities and not multi-generational colon colonies. What about space colonies? These would have to be miles wide to make the environment on the inside gravitationally comfortable. They'd also have to be terraformed. They also would be massively expensive projects. The justification for these is being given that we will run out of energy in about two or 300 years. And by then there will be trillions of us, so we have to move off the earth. Well, no, our global population is not on track to reach a trillion. And that requirement for energy assumes an economy on steroids that it's gonna double every 25 years and we'll need more and more energy to power it. Well, that growth assumption is not a foregone conclusion either. In fact, there is much talk these days about a circular economy in which recycling of materials is actually built into the manufacturing and distribu distribution process from the very beginning. And there are almost limitless energy sources down here, like nuclear energy, if only we would avail ourselves of them. In short, there's absolutely no good reason to prepare to move human civilization to space colonies or to Mars. And it is my opinion, irresponsible to put that specter before us and present it as a reasonable and realistic response to the mess that we have created here on Earth. Another fantasy is getting in an interstellar spaceship and traveling to another star to colonize an Earth-like planet. This is even crazier. 
The Voyager spacecraft, the farthest and fastest human-made vehicles now making their way to the stars, will take about 80,000 years to get to the nearest one, and that's only four light years away. And they were only the mass of a small car. What about launching thousands of colonists and all their support structure to the nearest star? Even if there were a perfectly suitable planet waiting there for us, that would take far longer at Voyager type speeds. I mean, longer than 80,000 years. You might ask, well, what about relativistic travel? Well, to the travelers, it would take far, far shorter, of course, because of you know, uh, relativistic travel, but it's ridiculously, absurdly, prohibitively, well, it's energy prohibitive, that's the message. But let's say we could, we could manage to get as much energy as we possibly needed. Here's a thought. As you approach the speed of light, you would be heading into an increasingly energetic and intense bombardment of cosmic rays and other particles and interstellar um, dust particles and so on. And after only a few years of 1G acceleration, even the cosmic background radiation, which is now at a temperature of near absolute zero, would be Doppler shifted from the microwave into a lethal heat bath that would be hot enough to melt all known materials. See what I mean? The only way that we will ever entertain the notion of humans traveling interstellar is if scientists managed to find that the universe admits the possibility for matter to travel faster than the speed of light without causing harm or annihilation. Something that is presently disallowed by the laws of physics as we presently understand them today. So I say, let's not distract ourselves now with preparations for such a trip until scientists have shown that it is possible and practical. And in the meantime, if there is any interstellar travel in our future, it will very likely be conducted by artificial intelligence. I want you to think of how the computer without David Bowman or Frank Poole. I introduce you to the interstellar astronaut of the future. And there it is. There is another very disturbing aspect of the commercial space enterprise, and that is the absolutely reckless rush to increase the number of artificial satellites in orbit around the Earth. At present, 4.7 billion people, or 60% of the global population, have access to the internet. Well, the commercial space industry is very eager to connect the remaining 3.3 billion and what is being called a humanitarian push to connect the globe. And it has its sight set on the orbital space around the Earth. And this is now a race that is rapidly developing into another tragedy in the making. Let me explain. Elon Musk through SpaceX was the first big player out of the gate with a proposal for a major constellation of Earth orbiting satellites to be the backbone of a commercial space-based internet called Starlink. In mid-2019, SpaceX launched 60 Starlink communication satellites in one launch, and they've been launching more ever since. Now, before that launch, there were roughly 3,700 satellites in orbit around the Earth, about 1,500 active and 2,200 dead or inactive. Now those accumulated over six decades of uh, space activities, ever since 1957 or 58. That's, that amounted 60 years, 60 plus years later, 60 years later roughly, to 3,700 satellites. Well, as of today, there are a total of 6,000 now alive and dead in Earth orbit, and the vast majority of those are in low Earth orbit, and that includes 2,900 Starlink satellites at about 500 kilometers altitude. So much closer to the Earth than geosynchronous orbit. Uh, where am I here? Um, I've just lost my place. 
That's okay. So by the mid 2020s, Musk is planning to have 12,000 satellites spread around the Earth, and he's already secured permission from the US authorities to launch an additional 30,000 on top of this, making a constellation of satellites in low Earth orbit approaching 42,000. That's seven times the current number of satellites there today. What will that look like? Well, let's look at what's there today. This shows you a video. These, this is it. There are organizations that track satellites. So this is what's really going on up there. Shows you 6,000 satellites active and not currently in orbit around the Earth in both low or Earth orbit and above. When we pull out, do you see, I hope geosynchronous orbit is way out there, okay? This is what this looks like in three dimensions. So we're looking down, the low Earth orbit satellites are basically, you know, covering the surface from this vantage point. Geosynchronous is up there at uh, the green line across and everything in between is just where those satellites, all the satellites there, uh, you're, this is a time capture. I mean, at, at an instant, this, picture was taken essentially. So I ask you, imagine seven times this number, that's Starlink alone, but it doesn't end there. The race is now on. Jeff Bezos of Blue Origin has similar, if not so ambitious plans. He's also intending to create his own internet with 3,300 satellites. That project is known as Project Kuiper. Richard Branson is planning a 640 satellite internet constellation. The government of the, the UK government backed organization called OneWeb initially filed a request for something like 47,000 satellites. They now have revised their plans. They're down to about 6,300. And as anyone could predict, it's now becoming an international race. I mean, everyone's got now the fear of missing out. No one wants to. Let this happen without participation. So China, along with Russia, they're both fearful of the potential implications of non-sovereign controlled internet access, and they are expected to put up over 13,000 satellites in their own constellations. And Canada is aiming for a 300 satellite constellation, and there are many, many more who wish to join this party. As it stands now, and I hope you're sitting down, there are a total number of proposed satellites of 430,000, 72 times more satellites than what is up there now. Now, it's not likely they'll all get chosen, but let's say half do. Let's say we end up with 200,000. There are many reasons to be concerned and even terrified of these developments. And I'm just gonna mention a few. The justification for these huge satellite systems is that half of the world is not connected, right? And needs to be connected. Remember, it's called, it's marketed as the humanitarian push to connect the globe, but it's not at all clear that, that the poorest segment of the world's population will even be able to afford the price of admission. I don't think anyone has asked them, would you rather have internet or would you rather have clean water or a stable food source? or access to healthcare or an education. And don't forget, this is a race. There will be winners and there will be losers. And it is easy to imagine some organization on the losing end deciding to make an exit and quitting their operations. What happens to their satellites? Who will maintain them? Who will be responsible for deorbiting them? In our country, I will bet you it will be the taxpayer and we will be paying for it. Further, with hundreds of thousands of satellites up there, there are bound to be collisions. And yes, things falling from space usually burn up in the atmosphere, but some things don't and they can reach the ground. And it has been shown that with enough satellites, one collision can lead to more collisions, creates more and more debris, which leads to more collisions yet again in an exponential fashion. It's even been given a name, it's called the Kessler syndrome. At the moment, there are already 840 close satellite encounters per week by SpaceX satellites alone. And by a close encounter, we mean a SpaceX satellite getting close to another satellite from another company or a piece of debris. And, that mean, and coming within one kilometer of each other. 
And this is according to the head of an autonomous space traffic management system. So now imagine 72 times more satellites. It's not pretty. <clears throat> Excuse me. Also, it is to me frightening to think of assets above our heads in the hands of possibly hostile, imbalanced, rogue actors. I know it sounds like something out of James Bond, but it's not impossible. I first mentioned this aspect of the problem in a talk like this one that I gave in August of 2021. Only three months later, in undoubtedly a chest-beating display, Putin used a Russian direct ascent anti-satellite system to shoot down one of his own satellites, and that created a massive debris cloud of 1,500 trackable pieces of debris. This is one of those instances when I would rather have been wrong, and instead I was right. By the way, this is not the first time this has happened. China shot down one of its weather satellites in 2007, and India destroyed one of its satellites with a ground-launched ballistic missile interceptor in 2019. They weren't trying to you know, rile anybody up, but I just make the point that all those satellites above our heads pose a danger in the hands of the wrong people, a serious danger. And at the moment, though it is hard to believe, there are in place insufficient regulations on these systems, insufficient monitoring, tracking, and protocols for deciding who will be the one to initiate an avoidance maneuver. And there is no enforceable space treaty in place for how all these players should work together internationally and what the punishment will be for not obeying the rules. So this, I'm gonna make the analogy. This is like building a huge, system of roads and allowing untold numbers of vehicles onto these roads before issuing driver's licenses and vehicle inspections and establishing traffic lights and stop signs and uh, a highway and, and traffic regulations and a highway patrol to regulate all the traffic. It's, it's, it's shockingly absurd. And another segment of the population, the astronomical community, happens to be up in arms about this. Why? Well, consider this. Low Earth orbit, which is about from 160 kilometers to about 2,000 kilometers altitude above the surface, as you saw, is very different than the usual synchronous orbit for communication satellites or weather satellites at 36,000 kilometers above the surface. In geosynchronous, those satellites are so high, you only need a few to reach longitudes all around the globe. But closer satellites in low Earth orbit become more visible from the surface at certain hours after sunset and before sunrise at low latitudes. And at high latitudes, like Canada and I presume Northern Europe, they can be visible all night long. What do these satellites look like from the ground? Well, here is a long exposure image shown one after the showing uh, Starlink satellites one after the other, uh, soon after they're launched, before they achieved orbit. So this wouldn't be going on all the time, but this shows you how visible they are uh, at the right times of day or the wrong times of day. And here is a picture of an imaging detector in the focal plane of a big telescope in Chile showing Starlink, Starlink satellites crossing the fields of view. It's, it's obvious how damaging these satellites will be to astronomical studies. We've already created such tragedies with the common resources we have here on the Earth, like the oceans that we share with others on our planet. And we are now about to do this in space and to our night sky as well. I am taking all of this personally. These developments and what could follow, hundreds of thousands of satellites in orbit above us will absolutely ruin the night sky, not just for those engaged in the scientific study of the cosmos, but for those of us who find perspective and meaning in the very sight of it. Consider this, the night sky is the only sight to fall that a human can behold that is 13.8 billion years old. In the perspective that it gives us of our own lives, 
It has the power to calm, to instruct, and to elicit wonder. We don't need to go up on a Jeff Bezos spacecraft to have an overview effect to realize how fragile our planet is. We can have an overview effect anytime we want by finding a place where we can view the sky on a clear moonless night and cast your eyes on the Milky Way. And if you work at it, you push yourself to see not a band of lights, but an enormous disk of stars viewed edge on, the whole scene will subtly pop into three dimensions. You will feel it in your gut. Some of you may have already had this experience. And at that moment, you will realize that you are already on a spaceship, traveling through and gazing upon your home galaxy. And you will know then that your existence is fragile but wondrous and that your life and that of all living creatures on earth is precious and that you are an integral but significant part of something indescribably immense and beautiful. Whoever robs us of that has taken away the birthright of all who live on this planet, and we mustn't let it happen. I will end by saying that after 40 plus years of planetary exploration, and with my last major professional assignment now behind me, I feel very much like an astronaut who's come home from the frontier. And while I was away, this is what I learned that there is no place in the solar system as suitable or as tailor-made for us as is the Earth. That its surface water oceans are unique and you won't find anything like them for at least several light years around. And that life on Earth and in its oceans is also, as far as we know now, unique in the solar system certainly in the degree and extent to which it has flourished here on our planet. These lessons have shown us that the earth is without question, the island paradise in our solar system, unique and precious in its life-giving beauty, and that we must dedicate ourselves to doing whatever we can to protect it or else we'll all perish. On a personal level, these lessons have made me an outspoken warrior in this battle, and I have strived wherever I could to encourage a planetary consciousness in the human inhabitants of this planet to make those lessons unmistakably clear to everyone. And in the service of that goal about a dozen or so years ago, I had the idea to take an image of the Earth with our Cassini cameras at Saturn. Like the famous Voyager pale blue dot picture of long ago, but this time with a twist. This time I called on the people of the world to go out while the image was being taken, look up at the sky and smile in celebration at the sheer joy of being alive with all our fellow earthlings on our beautiful fragile blue planet. And we did that in July of 2013. I called it the day the Earth smiled. It became a beautiful image of Saturn and its rings in the foreground and our blue ocean planet a billion miles in the distance, adrift in a sea of stars. The significance of this image lies not in its beauty, but in the uncorrupted, unpoliticized view it gives us of ourselves, a view of all of us together, all of Earth's creatures, together on this one tiny dot of a planet alone in the blackness of space. Our scientific explorations and images like this have shown us with unmistakable clarity that there is no planet B. There is literally no place else for us to go to survive and flourish without extraordinary, and I would submit unrealizable effort. Science fiction aside, Star Trek aside, Star Wars aside, the unpalatable truth may really be that humanity's last stand is right here, right where it all began. And the lesson going forward now is we had better make the best of it. And the wild notions of the high tech, uh, the high net worth commercial space fo folks are not what we need to get there. They are intoxicated on their own big ideas 
They want to build giant structures in orbit around the Earth. They want to jumpstart the habitability of an entire alien barren planet, all so that people could go to those places to live when the Earth becomes uninhabitable. Well, to them I say, instead of abandoning our planet, here's another crazy notion for you. Why not instead re-terraform the Earth? I would suggest as a place to start, how about showing our precious, fragile, endangered planet some love? And I mean an unconditional love, not a love that seeks profit and gain, a mother's love. These individuals have the power and the means to do this. They could challenge the obviously brilliant people who work in their organizations to figure out how to resolve our biggest crises like how to remove greenhouse gases from the atmosphere, how to remove plastics from the ocean, and how to get the peoples of the world to rise above nationalism and tribalism and work together on this because all of this is what it's gonna take. And if they were really interested in securing a noble, admirable legacy for themselves, that's what they should be doing with their energies and their vast resources. And if they did that, they would be forevermore remembered as the visionary individuals who led the way in pulling us back from disaster. They would be forevermore remembered as the engineers of what just could be humanity's finest hour. I say to them, make it so. And please remember, love the earth. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think that was definitely eye-opening and- uh, I hope so. I, if anybody here learned something they didn't know, I'd be very pleased. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, I do see a couple of questions from the audience. I think Kenan has a question. Um, roughly how big are the satellites? Um, are they the size of a car or the size of an airplane? Oh, um, I think normally they're about, <laughs> I don't really know. Um, I, I mean, I think they're smallish, but some, some proposals, believe it or not, have proposed really large satellites. Um, I don't know if they're, you know, they're not as big as the space station, but they're large and it's just ridiculous. Some of these companies proposing these large satellites have never built one before. So anyway, that's... Uh, that's my best try at that. Thanks. Warren has a question. Uh, Warren, do you want to unmute and ask the question yourself? Or I could read it out for you. Um, okay, I can um, go ahead and read. Uh, so if you have seen the expanse and put aside the mumbo jumbo about proto molecules, what do you think about the solar system wide colonization that it portrays? It ain't I'm, pretty. I'm sorry, I didn't. I didn't hear. I didn't get it. If I had seen what the expanse, I don't know what that is. Um, Let's see. It's a it's a television show. <laughs> oh, I don't watch television, so I'm. I'm uh, uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. I don't think I, but here's the thing, and I'm reversing a position I took probably 15 years ago, because now that I'm seeing how this is unfolding, uh, I'm not liking it. And, and I also have spent, now that I'm not, you know, consumed with a 24 seven day job, I've had the time to think some more about, think a lot more about these things. And I just, I think the whole thing is a fantasy. We're not gonna be going living on Titan. And, you know, I mean, if you just think about, if you yeah. think about how long, I mean, it takes a spacecraft, a, a very lightweight, reasonably lightweight spacecraft. Um, with gravity assists, it takes a long time to get to the outer solar system. Imagine having to take people and all the structure that they, all the things they would need to actually live there and do anything there in order to get them there in a reasonable amount of time so they don't have to spend their half their life just in travel, you have to accelerate them quickly, fast. 
and and it's an acceleration i would imagine that humans can endure you know this is what i mean would some would is there anybody who could really withstand even psychologically being confined in a small space for let's say six or 12 years i mean really <laughs> Yeah. So, but but you see, no one thinks about this. We're this is our mythology. This is what we humans the, li literally. These are our myths that we are going to populate the galaxy. We're going to travel interstellar. It just it sounds so romantic. Even I want to do it, but but it's not feasible. I mean, it's not practicable. That's certainly true. But I'm thinking it's not in the end even going to be feasible. And humans really don't. Our bodies don't like to be anywhere other than in 1G. So anyway, so it's, um, I, I just, you know, I, I like the idea that people like science fiction, that's great, but these guys, they're taking it literally, and that's the problem. Okay, that, th thank you so much. Thanks for the question, Warren. Um, Tucker, do you want to unmute yourself and ask the question? Sure, Th thank you, Niti. Uh, Dr. Porco, you've painted a bleak picture just in the near future of the problem of the satellite constellations. It, is there any international organization that currently exists, or you think might exist, that could curtail, curtail or, or at least reduce the, uh, the launch of these satellite constellations? Uh, well, I think there are efforts to... to put together some kind of treaty and some kind of organization that would have um, some authority here. But I, you know, I think, I think all there really is, even for the first six decades, you know, space activity, I think really all there were were treaties. I don't think an international, uh, any international organization could actually forbid somebody like the US decided, well, we don't care. We want to launch hundreds of thousands of satellites. I don't know if, if you know, if anything that would be put in place would have teeth. I mean, I, you know, people would have to be punished if they broke the laws. How's that going to work? I mean, you know, we we humans are remarkable at so many things, but one thing we're not good at is this cross tribal. Um, you know, union of efforts, the global unity of purpose is something I just, I mean, can you think of anything? I, I challenge, I challenge everybody I meet these days, think of something where the whole globe came together and decided this is something we have to do. The only thing anyone, and myself even, I thought of this too, was the ozone hole. You know, we got everybody who played a role in, in creating aerosols that had chlorofluorohydrocarbons or whatever they were called um, and were uh, destroying the ozone in the Arctic or in the polar regions. Um, we got them, there was pressure put on them or maybe they did it because it was an easy thing for them to do. They didn't use that the substance that was causing a problem. They found something else. Okay, but that was not, that doesn't touch the level of complexity of the problems we face now. I mean, people weren't even asked to make a sacrifice. I, none of us was asked, don't use aerosol cans anymore. They just figured out a way to swap out the bad molecule and figure out another way to do it. We're still using aerosol cans. So that was a trivial, uh, a trivial example of when the nations around the world, and I don't even know how many it required, said, yeah, let's do this. But this is one where, you know, there's lots of imbalance and the people who are really suffering are not the ones really causing the problems. So in order to help the people that are really suffering, the ones who are causing the problems have to back back down on their, st their standard of living and make sacrifices. It's hard to get people to do that. So, so anyway, I, I, I am kind of pessimistic, but sometimes I get optimistic. I don't know, I just bounce back and forth. I don't, I just, I know this though, uh, you may know all this too, that what we're seeing now as far as global warming is concerned, and in, in this country, but all around the globe, the fires, the droughts, the floods, the heat waves, and so on, um, these things are coming about 25 to 30 years earlier than climate scientists expected. So their predictions were actually 
conservative. And we're going to blow through. I saw some results of some uh, uh, some analyses. Um, several groups did this. And we were, the consensus, I think, is the earliest that we could blow through the one and a half degrees Celsius that was the target of the Paris Accord is two years. And I, don't, I forget what the outer limit was, you know, what the range was, but I'm focused on the two years because if the climate scientists kind of got too conservative and they missed by 25 or 30 years when we'd be seeing the effects we're seeing now, I'm thinking it's probably going to be two years when we're going to blow through one and a half degrees. And one and a half degrees was kind of, as I understood it, was kind of like the beginning of the end, because by the time you get to two degrees, as I understand it, I may be wrong about this, so go check this uh, yourselves, but by the time you get to two degrees, I, I'm under the impression that we can't fix anything that happens at that point. It's too late. We've passed some tipping point. So I'm, I'm, I've gone far afield of what you've, you've asked me, but essentially what you're saying is, can't there be some kind of international um, you know, patrol that issues tickets and, you know, puts you in jail if you do the wrong thing. And I just, I, I just don't see it happening. Okay. I want to say thank you. Although you understand that thank you is half-hearted because it's, it's so, so disappointing, but indeed, thank you. Dr. Well, well tell me though, did you not know this? No, I, I thought that there was probably the International Astronomical Union might have some say about this, but they don't control Bezos and they don't control the Russian equivalent. So I, I, I would imagine we were able to establish an international human rights accord, right? It, not that it's that effective, but at least it tried. The international. Oh, okay. So I think there, people, there, there are attempts to do this. I just can't see. I mean, I can't see how effective it's going to be. So. Yeah. I just can't. I mean, look, Putin, I mean, certainly as a warning, he just decided I'm going to blow up my own spacecraft just to show these people like what I got, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, dear. All right. Full hearted. Thank you, Dr. Porco. OK. Thanks so much, Tucker. Um, thank you, Ken. Um, I think, Warren, uh, do you have another question? No, no, I'm fine. I just okay. was, I made a couple of remarks okay. in the chat, so. Am I supposed, I, I've not done this before with the chat. Am I supposed to read the chat? Oh, it's, it's just a record. Yeah, I, I just, you know, you talked about how people can't spend a lot of time in a confined space. And, you know, then there was an experiment called Biosphere 2 in Arizona where- I lived, actually, in, I lived in Tucson, I know about it. Okay, yeah, with it, they didn't last all that long, maybe a year, and and they just started to go kind of bonkers. So, and they and they that. only and they only had to walk out the door. Could you imagine being right. in space and knowing that you know, first of all, outside your spacecraft is absolute death, and you are stuck. You're like in you're like in prison. Yeah, you know? I it's, so. Yeah. The, the other comment I made was I'm, I'm actually teaching a course on science fiction, and it's kind of depressing because the whole field has taken a decidedly apocalyptic turn in the past few decades. Uh, it used to be much more positive in the days of 2001, as you pointed out, but now the, the novels and movies commonly posit that the earth is basically wrecked and people have to escape to space or other planets. I, I, it's crazy, but okay. So that's why I say, you know, re-terraform the earth. If they've got the chutzpah and the resources and the intelligence and they got, they can figure out how to jumpstart the habitability of Mars, they can figure out how to fix the problems we have down here. Okay. I and mean, it, they really, they really good. could, they, they don't want to do that because it's not as sexy as going into space. Right. It would be good practice. Well, you know, I gave this talk at I gave this talk at Berkeley, uh, and I said, uh, I said to the audience, you know, everybody in this room who has a PhD had to take a qualifying exam. Well, this could be 
these the qualifying exam for these guys. Let them prove let them prove that they know what they're doing by doing it first down here. So anyway. Exactly. I agree. Okay. Thanks so much, Warren. Um, so I had a question. I was just uh, curious. Um, so you did mention about there being research bases in the South Pole, and you know probably we may have similar um, you know stations on the Moon or Mars. So because the distance is larger, I think the people like you know who would even go for research may stay there for longer compared to on the South Pole. So I was wondering, uh, in the long run, is there any possibility that there could be some kind of an evolution happening where people, you know, like humans may actually be able to adapt to the atmosphere or conditions there? I mean, I know this may sound science fiction, but just- Well, okay, so let me just tell you, there is no atmosphere. There's no atmosphere on the moon. Yeah, on, on the moon. But There's no atmosphere on Mars. All of that would have to be fabricated. If people go to the moon, I'm hearing you know, they're going to be living in caves. Um, people want to mine. You see, a lot of this is driven by economics. People are thinking we need metals. We need this. We need that. We need to go to space. We need to go mine asteroids. Um, I don't, I just, again, if, you know, the overhead for those activities is positively enormous. Where are they going to get them? I mean, you know, that's why, by the way, if you read me in between the lines, that's why these people, they all say this. They all say, oh, we're going to have more and more people. They need the Ponzi scheme that's currently in effect, okay, where the economy is growing because we have more and more people to work and they want this to keep going. Um, they need that to keep going so that they, you know, they can have enough people. Uh, to, you know, to, to basically enslave. I mean, I'm putting it in the rawest terms, but that's what they want to do. That's, you know, that's why they, they want the economy on steroids. That's what they're thinking. They want to make money. This is really about being the wealthiest guy in the world, making a lot of money. The whole thing, this whole space activity is called the next billion dollar industry, okay? And I, you know, here, I didn't put it in this talk. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to start saying this too. There is a moral argument to be made that the planets and the objects in the solar system should be considered like in international parks, like we have national parks. You leave them alone. You leave them the way they are because they have a, you know, they, we don't have a moral right to wreck them. So, I know that won't go over, but but um, but I I mean I feel that way, especially as a scientist. Should we go and wreck Mars? I mean I'm not that fond of Mars, but you know, should, do we have a right to do that? Yeah, that's so true. anyway, there are a lot of questions here, and they're all being all of it's being overlooked. They would like it if nobody put two and two together and and figured out. Oh my God, there's going to be hundreds of thousands of satellites up there. Think about this. There could be even so many satellites up there that it makes it really difficult to launch anything. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like they're, they're digging their own graves. So anyway, it was yeah. nice meeting you all and having the opportunity to talk. <laughs> sorry I'm leaving you. I'm sorry I'm leaving you with such, I better change the ending so people don't go, don't go off like wanting to jump off a cliff or something. No, no, this was really, I mean, it was informational and I, I mean, we all had a great time. Um, so thank you so much. Okay, okay. And say hello, please, to Tinka. I've yeah. never met Tinka. I don't think I've ever met her, so. Oh, uh, in 2015, I'm not sure if it was a live uh, event back then or uh, like in the theater or I don't know if it was a Zoom. Um, well, in 2015, I was up there in Mount Tam. Mount Tam, okay. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Yes, yes, I was up there in Mount Tam. Okay. It yeah. was very windy. I remember it was very windy and the screen almost blew away. Oh, wow. <laughs> so. Yeah, um, thanks so much. I, I did promise you we'll, you know, we'll wrap up by 8.30 p.m. So um, thanks, everyone. Um, th thank you, audience. I think it was really engaging and, you know, and, and, like we all had a great time. Um, thanks to Tinka as well um, for you know, uh, making all these events possible. And thank you so much, Karen. Um, yeah, this was a great talk and I'm sure uh, we all have a message 
you know, like to take with us and kind of like spread more awareness about, you know. Uh, Good. Good. Uh, Thanks a lot for inviting thank you me. So much. Bye. Okay. Bye bye. Thank I you. I guess this is an American Bye. language of applause. <laughs> and thank you, Niti. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> bye, Warren. <laughs>